The disease we now call primary biliary cholangitis, or for short PBC, has quite a long history. The first description of the condition was by Addison and Gull in 1851, who reported on chronic obstructive jaundice with cirrhosis and no obstruction of the large bile ducts. A further description was made by Hannah in 1875, and for some time the condition was known as Hannah's cirrhosis. The modern story of PBC began in 1950, when Ahrens and his colleagues described investigations into the condition, and they gave it the name primary biliary cirrhosis, also PBC. In these early modern years, the typical features of PBC became well recognized. Gradually progressive obstructive jaundice, mainly in women, itching, hyperlipidemia and fatty deposits in the skin, and eventually liver failure and portal hypertension. So how was this disease to be diagnosed during life? Liver biopsy was essential to making the diagnosis of PBC and very important in understanding its pathology. However, in earlier times, the use of liver biopsy was limited by the fact that biopsies had to be obtained at operation. Accordingly, techniques for removing samples of liver for examination without an operation were developed. Everson and Roholm in 1939 reported a method of aspiration biopsy using a needle in just over a hundred patients, and Mengini in 1965 reported a technique of aspiration biopsy which rapidly became very widely used. Most recently, liver biopsy has been done while directly observing the liver with ultrasound, which has improved the safety of the procedure. Examination of liver biopsy tissue in a large group of patients with PBC allowed Rubin and his colleagues in 1965 to localize the early site of damage to the small biliary cholangioles in the liver and to describe the stages of the disease as it progressed to cirrhosis. Sherlock described 42 patients with PBC in 1959, and she noted that by no means all patients with PBC had cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis, and because of this, she disagreed with the name primary biliary cirrhosis. Rubin and his colleagues in 1965 also noted that not all patients with PBC had cirrhosis at the time of biopsy. Accordingly, proposals for a new name for the disease were proposed, but none met with general approval, perhaps because suggested names, such as chronic non suppurative destructive cholangitis, would that have made it CNSDC rather than PBC, were all rather cumbersome. It was not until Bewers and his colleagues in 2015 reported on the outcome of an international meeting at which patients were present that the name primary biliary polangitis, thankfully also PBC, which we use today, was agreed. Two further technological advances provided important information on the nature and diagnosis of PBC. First, the identification of the anti-mitochondrial antibody by Walker and colleagues in 1965. The anti-mitochondrial antibody was found in over 90% of patients with PBC. It proved to be very specific to PBC and it placed PBC firmly in the group of autoimmune diseases. 
Not only is the anti-mitochondrial antibody central to the diagnosis of PBC, but the long-term study of individuals who have the anti-mitochondrial antibody, but no clinical or occasionally even biochemical indications of liver disease, has allowed the evolution of PBC from its earliest stages, its wider symptomatology, and its relation to other autoimmune diseases to be understood. Thus, symptoms such as fatigue, loss of motivation, and fibromyalgic or arthritic symptoms, only too well known to patients, are now recognized. Second has been the development of imaging by ultrasound, computed tomography, and magnetic resonance imaging. Generally, ultrasound is most used in the diagnosis of PBC, and it is able to exclude with confidence large duct biliary obstruction. Together, these two advances, the anti-mitochondrial antibody and liver imaging, have eliminated the need for liver biopsy in the diagnosis of PBC in all but a few cases with unusual clinical features or where the anti-mitochondrial antibody test has been negative. Neither patients nor physicians are enamoured with liver biopsy. It can have serious complications, and being able to dispense with it has been a significant advance. In respect of medical treatment, we have means to help symptoms of PBC, such as itch, but as yet we do not have any curative treatment. Bile acids have long been thought to be in, involved in the damage to the small bile ducts in the liver, and clinical trials have shown that the bile acid, ursodeoxycholic acid, can significantly reduce the progression of PBC in most patients. For patients who do not respond to ursodeoxycholic acid, recent reports indicate that most may respond to obeticholic acid. Some patients still progress to develop cirrhosis and the complications of liver failure and portal hypertension, and for these patients, liver transplantation is available. Following liver transplantation, over 90% of patients should be alive at a year, and about 80% after five years. It is unfortunate that after five years, some 20% will have had some recurrence of their PBC, and after 10 years, some 30%. And so, PBC has come a long way since it was first described in 1851, but we still have a long way to go. The cause or causes that trigger the onset of PBC remain a mystery, and we badly need a curative medical treatment. Future advances will need scientific investigation, and the contribution of organisations such as the PBC Foundation and of patients willing to take part in investigations will be absolutely central to this further progress. However, we should look forward to the future with hope and with determination. Thank you.